Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today my guest is Hamid Ali. Hi Hamid. Hey Ian. And Hamid is also known as A.H. Almas, which is his pen name and he's written about 20 books altogether. I have a few of them here. The Unfolding Now, Realising Your True Nature Through the Practice of a Presence. Diamond Heart, Book 5, which obviously indicates there's a Book 1, 2, and a Book 2, and a Book 3, and a Book 4 as well. It's the last of the series, yeah. And Essence, The Diamond Approach to Inner Realisation, and The Point of Existence, which is quite dense, but also very fascinating. So, Hamid, it's interesting, I was realising earlier that last time I was in Amsterdam, I came for a conference and it was quite a difficult time in my life. I was going through some changes and I left one spiritual school and I wasn't quite sure where I was. And I had dinner with somebody who said, you know what, the diamond approach, the Ridwan school, which is your school, could be the right thing for you now. And uh, I found out there was a a group happening in northern Germany near Bremen and I went, that was just a few weeks later, I went to the, the first group and that was very instrumental for me in understanding where I was more and also very much a catalyst for changing my life. And when we were, we were talking earlier you, you were saying to me that at 13 you became interested in finding out more about life and at that point you thought that maybe science had the, had the answers for you. That's what I thought. And for a long time, I became a scientist. But it really started for me by just feeling. I didn't think about it. It's just a feeling that I wanted to know what is reality? What it, what's all this about? What is the real truth of all of this that we experience? And I thought science will give me an objective knowledge, not somebody's opinion, not somebody's story was written, you know, beliefs. And so I knew about relig religions and all that, but the, what I knew was like story. I couldn't tell whether they're really true, but I thought science at that time, and partly the influence on my teacher, I had good science teachers. So I got okay. interested in mathematics, uh, physics, and chemistry. First, I thought I thought I'll be a chemist, but then it turned out to be more a physicist. So when I went to college, I went to the U.S. and studied physics in Berkeley, California. And you see, thirteen's quite early for someone to have this desire, if you like, this calling to ask these deep questions. Were, were you, was that something you could share with your contemporaries or was this quite an isolated thing for just you? No, I think many people feel that in different ways. And for me, it wasn't exactly an explicit kind of question in my mind, you know, that was driving me. It was like part of my life. I was just that, that way. Mm. You know, I thought that way. I wanted to know what is reality and like in classes and different. Like we had religion classes and, and science classes, a different kind of psychology classes. I was all in, uh, interested in what's it, what is it, what's it all about? And I thought physics, especially deep theoretical physics, can go deep into what is it, what's happening. That is not anybody's opinion or idea. Or I want to know the truth as it you is. You want to know the truth as, as it, it is. is. And yeah. I thought, at that time, I thought science will do it until I've, and I went into science very far. Mm. I was at the point of getting my PhD in nuclear physics when I realized that's not what I'm looking for. Yes. That I mean, it was an interesting story. I don't know if you ever heard of how I realized that. I was, uh, I used to work in, in uh, 
in graduate school in uh, Lawrence Rad Lab in Berkeley. That's when they first did the research on nuclear, you know, and, and atom bomb and all that, where Edward Teller and other people used to work. So I had my office there, so, and I was in the cafeteria one time for lunch, where all the professors and graduate students there I was sitting having lunch, and, I, and for some point, for some reason, I was looking around. And I looked, and all those brilliant physicists and mathematicians were some of the top in the world. And it struck me, I don't want to be like that. And, and, and I felt that way because I saw something. I saw those brilliant big heads and nothing else. Mm. And I realized, no, mm. that's not the kind of truth I'm looking for, that's not the kind of life I want. Big head, great intelligence, but the rest is almost gone. So it's like there. knowledge without depth almost. Yeah, well, knowledge without completeness, without, it's Completely. like partial, so it's okay. part, part of being human, Yes. part of the truth. And it was an intuitive thing. It's partly is like recognizing him, the truth I'm looking for is not doesn't isn't going to happen that way. I realized at that time, and partly seeing that, you know, because I I was thinking I was going to uh, uh, get my PhD and become professor and teach and do research in physics. That was my intention. I realized no, uh, my research is, is not that. I just learned at that, that, that point, and then I lost complete interest in physics. And I go to my office to do research, and every day, every morning, I go I sit at the desk to write all these equations, and within half an hour I'm asleep. Mm. That happened for weeks. Mm. Finally, I went to my professor and told him, I can't do it. So what were the clues that took you to the next stage? And I know you started to do some experimental workshops. And then what happened is that I got interested in various kind of workshops, different kind of individuals. I went to Esalen, for instance. Okay, some in California, know about Esalen, yes. I did yeah. some kind of workshop. I went to various, <coughs> uh, I learned, uh, I learned meditation, like I went to learn transcendental meditation, TM. You know, for a while. That was one of the first meditations I ever learned. Did that work for you? I liked it. Yeah. I still like it. You know, and, but I didn't go deep into that school because they can go deeper. Mm. You know, if, if you followed uh, um, Maharishi, I didn't do it that way. But um, it was one thing I learned. But I did a lot of psychological thing. I want uh, the Gestalt therapy, adult bioenergetic. I actually got a bioenergetic therapist. You know, I did several years of it, and I did Riken therapy. You know, for several years, and I worked with the various Gestalt groups and and therapists, and um, I did many of what's called human potential movement. I was pretty involved in it and learning various things. And until, of course, I met uh, Claudio Naranjo in Esalen. It was an Esalen workshop. He was doing on meditation and gestalt therapy. And he approached me at some point during the workshop, and he said, you know, I'm forming a group in Berkeley to work more on that thing, if you want to be, because I, he knew I was living in Berkeley. And I said, oh, good. And I'm, so I went to that group. And of course, Claudio taught a combination of psychology, work with psychology, and meditation. He, different, he, he, he taught different forms of meditations, and he worked with psychology by using the Enneagram of fixations, and he has a lot of psychological background because he was a Karen Horne uh, student. And so he, which, which he emphasized self-analysis. So he taught us self-analysis, basically. And plus, so he did, he did the two uh, 
direction, psychology and spirituality side by side. And, and hardly anyone was bringing that together, were they, that, those two yeah, things together? Yeah, he was one time. of the first pioneers, yeah. I'll say, of seeing that psychology and spirituality can go together. And he had a great title, he called it Seekers After Truth. Yes. Which science. must have really appealed that's to you. Yeah. That could, that's what Gurdjieff called his work. I didn't realise that. Yeah, okay. Seeker from Gurdjieff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to do yeah. So, and then you were also, I think, in, I'm just looking at my notes here, you, you were involved with the fourth way teaching as well. Was that what was after that time? What happened, you see, Claudio was instrumental in some sense, Claudio Naranjo, in my development, not in terms of my realization or my, uh, my liberation, but in terms of going in that direction. Because he knew he had something, but he didn't have everything. So he introduced the students to many other teachers. Mm. He brought many other teachers. He brought Rinpoche's, he brought uh, Taoist masters, he brought Hindu masters, he brought Sufi masters. So I got to work with many of those people, like one of the Rinpoche's, for instance, Tibetan Lama I worked with for several years. I learned a lot about Tibetan Buddhism. And I worked with E.J. Gold, who had more fourth way orientation and, uh, and uh, also Sufi orientation. I worked with another person who was more Grigifian, fourth way. I worked with him for several years. And uh, at the same time, I was still continuing with my uh, Rakian therapy. And also I was doing my psychological, uh, you know, physical body work too. Breathing and energizing, liberating the body. At the same time that I was learning, working with those various teachers, and it is by the time I was working with that fourth way teacher, at some point, I was beginning to have experiences, right, of what I call essential nature. When I talked to him about it, he didn't recognize him. He dismissed them. So what kind of experiences were they at that time? I was experiencing something that I felt as truth. I was feeling I'm experiencing truth. But and I could uh, feel it, okay. sense it, see it, and it was like pretty palpable sense of presence, of truth, which is so present as like a conscious mass of 25 carat gold. I became like a statue of gold. And Just like the gold statue you see of the Buddhas, felt like that and felt I am gold I'm not I am truth and I recognize that gold that the alchemist called gold is truth mm. true truth truth the truth I was looking for I was looking for what is objective truth so when I talked to this teacher about some of those things he didn't sort of recognize it and that began to have you know a peaceful congenial separation from him's work and I then went on my way because I was thinking it was developing in me. And I think one other influence, but you were talking the other night about influence. Because of my interest at that time, I met the 16th Karmapa. You I know, don't know what that is. The Karmapa is one of the leading figures in Tibetan Buddhism. Okay. Yes. And he does what's called the black hat ceremony where he transmits the teaching of his lineage. It was called Mahamudra. He is the head of the Mahamudra lineage. Okay. And he does a, a, an initiation where he transmits that state. So I went to his transmission. That was the early 70s. And I got a headache. <laughs> Many people had Clarity and light, I had a headache for several years. Reminded me of Krishnamurti, who had headaches for many years mm. at the beginning, when I had a headache. And I went from one person to another, doctors, and then went to yogis, Hindu yogis. He said, oh, this is just some kind of gas. He gave it some name. When I talked to the Rinpoche, I, I knew. He told me this is light. 
But I know exactly what it meant. But in time, when I start working psychologically you know, on what is this, like an obstruction in the head, at some point there was like things during, when, during the meditation, things as if something flowed down, descended. And it was light, but it wasn't light the way people know it. It's more like liquid light. And I felt it as my presence. That is my being, mm. presence. And that was the discovery of presence, which I then talked to my friends too, like Karen. Karen Johnson, Johnson. yes. I yeah. talked to her yeah. about it. She'll talk to you about how she received it. And she got it right away. And I yes. thought other people will get it right away. Mm. But th that was the beginning of the diamond approach. Because that presence, which is the truth of reality, the truth of what I am, didn't just stay that way. It developed and grew and manifested so many things about itself and the rest of reality and what I am. But how did that realization, that manifestation, mm -hmm. influence you in how you, in your day-to-day -day life, like how you, how you interacted with other people, how you went out and about? How did that, was that always with you? And how did that change, change things on, on a personal basis? A good question. Ian. At the beginning, when I was first learning, I noticed I was not interested in people. Like, I was married, right? And we had a house, and I was, had a small group I was working with. But I was not interested in social contacts. Like, my wife would invite people, I stay in my room, won't go. And really? She didn't? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And I'm, I might say hi, then go back to my room. Huh. I, didn't want, I was interested in what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I saw that every, all these other things will be distractions. For several years, it stayed like that. I, was not, I, I didn't dislike people or anything like I was friendly and fine, but I didn't want the usual social, practical thing to dominate. And that was natural. I didn't think it. I just did, it was that way. And that allowed this truth, this presence, this awareness to grow and develop and teach. Teach me, teach my mind, and teach other people. Mm. But then, of course, it changed. That started impacting my behavior and my relationship to people. And one of the ways it presented itself is personalness, what we call the pearl beyond price. The how to be not just this consciousness, conscious of itself as presence, but how it can be a person who interacts with another person, like I'm interacting with you. Okay. I am the true nature, but I'm also a human being. Showed me not only how to be a human being, but what is a real human being. Yes, it, that reminds me that, that when I got the first book of yours, yeah. the line I read that really hit me was being, being man in the world, but not of the world. Yeah. And I think you're touching on the beginning of that in terms of you were, you were beginning to find that, yes, there was presence there, and also being in the world was important, living the yeah. potential of the human being. So that, you see, that expression, being in the world and not of it, is a Sufi expression. Okay. which I found very appealing to me. What was happening, that expression was appealing, and the, that presence revealed what that means, which is, I think I didn't want to, those interactions and those social things, because it would have been being in the world and of it. I'll be like everybody else mm. lost in the usual, ordinary way of experiencing things and not being in contact with this deeper, more fundamental truth. So being in the world, but not of it, is like, I am now the presence of reality, but I'm talking. 
to you, with you. Yes. We're discussing things. And I feel that I have a heart and so do you. And our hearts are communicating. Yes. And then, and it's, it's amazing wisdom, it showed. You know, how to be contactful, how to be personal, how to be aware of the other person and their uniqueness and be attuned to them and what hurts, what doesn't hurt, what's useful. What... So, although the truth is sort of impersonal, but also can present a personal quality that makes it, shows what is life and how life can be lived from a place from outside of life. Like really uh, being in, in the world and not of it. Not of it means I'm not of the physical, I'm not of a, just an individual human being with a history, with a mother and father who has a job. And who, no, I am something much more mysterious, much faster. Much, you, at the same time, I am a human being who is a conduit for that. So that mystery works through the individual and lives as an individual. It reminds me of a Christian perspective, says, I liveth not, but Christ liveth in me. Mm. See? So I, I can say, I liveth not, but Christ the truth is within, yes. liveth in me. Yeah, yeah. That's one way of saying it. And the starting point really for being a more real human being is the recognition of presence, isn't it? Because that gives you the reference point that gives you the start. I, I like to call it the ground of being. Mm -hmm. And with that, I know for myself, and the danger is running off on these automatic programs, but somehow if there's a groundedness and a feeling of presence, and in, in your books you call it essence a lot of the time, mm -hmm. with that essence, mm -hmm. then we have something real from which to relate from. Exactly, something real, authentic. And uh, because usually the ordinary sense that I was, and most people are, is to be an individual that is mostly the creation of our history and our mind, our ideas about ourselves, the programming from our childhood. That makes us be a kind of self, and we believe we are that self. And we believe we are the body with the mind, basically. So we, most of us don't know until we wake up. That's what spiritual work is all about, is to wake up to what are you really? Mm. What is reality? Mm. And so that was the beginning of my waking up. You see, you know, I think that, that uh, what happened in the, in the cafeteria was the beginning of waking I didn't recognize through nature, but I realized that wasn't me. I didn't want to be that way. Yes. The next thing is recognizing, oh, that's me. That's what I am, and that's what everybody is. But why, isn't, why doesn't that spark become more of a flame in most people? Because it's still, although there's a growing interest in waking up, it's still quite rare that somebody has the, the courage and the motivation, the drive, if you like, to really follow things through like you have. Why is that? And I, I think you actually said to, Mm -hmm. One of the things I wrote down was that the, the depth of, if I can find it quickly, the exact quote, but the, here it is. Um, no, I'm not going to find it. It doesn't matter. Yes, I've got it. Yeah. Man is asleep. Little do we know what this means, the extent of this sleep. Yes. And the more I've learned a lot through your work, I've realized how man's asleep and how I'm asleep. Yeah. So, how is it that there's not more of it? It's so obvious when you see it. How obvious there is, uh, how is it there isn't more of a, an interest in this search in most people? Yeah. So different teachings will explain it in different ways. Some teachings say your karma. If your Eastern teachings are karma. If you come from more Western teach, teaching, they'll say God's will. God's grace comes some people, but not others, right? Um, 
the way I, I understand it, which is just another story, because nobody really knows the true reasons behind it. It's a mystery, and we can just have approximations of it. Is that reality as a whole, the truth I saw, the first I realized as truth, which then I realized as love, but then I realized as awareness and consciousness, conscious of itself and its presence, at some point revealed that it is not just something inside me, but it is everywhere, inside you, inside everybody, inside everything. It is not only inside everything, it is everything. It is the inside of everything, the other side of everything. Our physicality, our thoughts, the chairs and the furniture is the outside, the, the outside, the appearance of something alive and mysterious and conscious. And that reveals itself in different ways, like it's experimenting with different ways it experiences reality. So it experiences reality through the rock, through the tree, through the alligator, through human beings. And then at some point, through some human being, it wakes up completely to what it is, mm. you see. Now, and it is not something that chooses to do it one way or another. It is, you know, uh, you hear lately about intelligent design, like the scientists realizing that this universe has a, a design that seems to indicate intelligence. And some people use it to say, yeah, that means because it's God created things that way. I think of intelligent design more as this uh, consciousness, this force, is intelligent. And just as intelligence usually experiment with this and that, some experiments work better than others, it is like that. It is evolving and developing different ways it can reveal itself. And some places it succeeds in revealing itself more fully. Yes. Than other, other places, it's still working. And probably will reveal itself one way or another. So I don't think me as an individual is what did it. I'm not as special as an individual. It is being itself, true nature itself, this mysterious force and power and nature beyond is somehow chose this individual and put him through various kind of experiences, like made me be born in Kuwait and live there for 18 years, made me go to the US, study physics. So I, my mind will, will have the precision and the logic of the scientist, and then made me go and study psychology so I can understand the mind and consciousness, and then oriented me toward particular books, toward particular teaching, It, it used my mind and consciousness and body to know itself. And now it knows itself, and I realize that is what I am. At the same time, I am the individual he would be. So the back and the front. Yes. The front is the individual that you see. The back is an unfathomable, unfathomable mystery that can reveal itself in many ways. I can be love, I can be truth, I can be awareness, I can be non-dual awareness, or I can be dual awareness. So when you say you have this knowing, yeah. then talk more about the knowing. Is it a knowing that is expanding the whole time, or is the base of the knowing always there and always based at the same thing? It is more than knowing. It is, uh, it is difficult to say what it is. In fact, there is no way to describe it, to delimit it, because it's unlimited in what it is. But it has the capacity to know. Knowing is one of its capacities. Consciousness, awareness is one of its capacities. What people call non-dual awareness is just one of its capacities. Mm -hmm. It can be aware in other ways, you see. And it is uh, this truth, this reality,
that expresses itself through all of us. That's what I see. And it is not just the basis, it is the basis of my teaching, right? And to even say my teaching is not act, it's not mine. It's through nature's teaching. No, I'm only, yeah. uh, you know, uh, an instrument, the, the individual that's called Hamid is an instrument for this uh, magnificent and fathomable truth to express itself and to know itself and enjoy the rea life on earth. How something indefinite, formless becomes a human being who walks and talks and experiences and loves and interacts. That is an amazing thing. But it's a miracle. It's, it's a miracle. In so many it, ways. And it's always yeah. a miracle. Yes. When we recognize that, yeah. so when, we, when we're just in our usual, the ordinary level of experience, we don't see the miracle. We mm. think we are those biological entities who are trying to survive and maybe be happy. And when we recognize this, recognize, we, when we recognize our true nature, we realize, no, it's an adventure. Yes. It's an adventure of discovery, of learning, of developing. And living life is a matter of discovering and expressing what we discover at the same time. Yes. So I, I live it, enjoy it, but I'm also learning all the time. And, and I, when I use the word I, uh, it's, it's, it's confusing because there's no I in the usual sense. And consciousness, the excitement of your learning is coming from consciousness, the expression again of consciousness. I as a consciousness. Yes. Enjoy you. <laughs> I can feel your heart. Right. I could feel the sweetness between us. You know, and, I could, and that for me brings us closer. Because we're already one in a very deep way, from the consciousness perspective, which is what my essence is, my true nature, my true condition, my true being. There's no separation between us. And on our, in our human form, yep. in a way, that's what we're seeking, isn't it? We're seeking this completeness the whole time. And, and we look outside, and we try and have more of this and more of that because we want to feel happier and better on the inside. But and maybe it's an oversimplification, yeah. but the way I see it is, that's all a way. It's all a, a false way in its own way of trying somewhere to get back to the one, to the completeness. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a false way. I would say a misinterpretation. Okay. Because it is natural to be ha want to be happy because our nature is happiness and we want to be our, our nature. It's inherent to us. Every human being wants to be happy. Why? Why don't they want to be depressed? You can imagine a race of beings who want to be depressed or want to be hateful all the time. No, human beings want to be happy. Why? Yeah. Because it, we are moved from deep within us, from the depth to be happy because that is what we are. If we really are relaxed and open and at ease and being ourselves completely, we're pure delight. Pure delight. Pure delight. Yeah. There's, there's something I want to explore with you in terms of the different stages that, that you went through and I think other people go through in their own way. And I think, I think you talk about, first of all, there was, there was a realization there was presence, yeah. which you called essence, and you were with essence, and then there was a realization or the integration that essence and you were the same thing, mm -hmm. and then there was a further realization that you were the ground of being, I think yeah. you said containing essence. Yeah. Can you just talk us through yeah, those stages? Yeah, that's the, the stage I went through. Because some people, some masters, they say they had an awakening and they're suddenly enlightened and they see everything is one. It didn't happen exactly that way with me. For me, it was a growing, a, a presence that grew. It had 
an infinite mystery in it. And it was teaching my mind and my consciousness about it step at a time. So first I was experiencing it as something that comes, some descends or arises, you know, descending force. Some people call it like Aurobindo or something that arises within, comes from deep within the heart. And I was still being the human individual, what I call the person or the person or the self. At some point, the, the, that presence manifested itself in such a way that it confronted, made me confront my identity. What am I? Am I really this person experiencing this presence? And I realized that that person was a shell, an empty construct of concepts and ideas and uh, memories from the past that my mind has constructed. But when you saw that, how yeah. was that for you? Because that's quite a devastating realization. It was. It, it made me feel to be that individual. I realized it felt empty, meaningless. And I realized, oh, that's why sometimes I feel life is meaningless. Mm. I realized, oh, that's why sometimes I feel like there's no significance. Turned out that was that's inherent to the sense of the ordinary self, which is what I call the ego self, which for me is a stage of development. Being manifest self gradually, this is one of its first stages. And, I then, and then I saw a gap between that and this luminous presence. And that gap felt like an abyss, so scary. Mm -hmm. And at some point, by knowing the psychology, I was led to study self-psychology. Kauhatz, Kernberg, and other. That through that's guidance. I saw those books. So that's what I want to read. I saw them in a Karen's husband's house. who was studying psychiatry. So that's interesting. I wasn't interested in those things before, and I studied and learned about self psychology and how the self developed. And I said, Oh yeah, that's how. It was. And I realized, but that is not exactly me. That is a fake self. False self. It's a reflection of you. I think you yes. talk about it being a reflection. A reflection. It's, it's like a partial. Yes, glimpse. Uh, yeah. par uh, partial expression of what I am. And, but I was seeing it, that's what I am. And then that showed, uh, and that belief created a separation from the true nature, or from the luminous consciousness. And when I saw that disconnection, the disconnection dissolved. And as it dissolved, I realized that is that luminous presence is what I am, mm. and that was it. It continued to be that way, but that con that that luminous presence wasn't just one thing. It kept growing and developing. So what I am is not one static thing. That's what many people believe. That you get realized, enlightened, and you become pure awareness or pure emptiness or pure love. I have been those. Yes. And I still am those. But I am something else also. Something more mysterious. And are there times in life practically you look back on the response that, that, that you as Hamid had to a certain event and you see that that could be more refined, that response, and you, so you, you make a decision or there's a realization that next time you might act differently. Are those human, those human processes still running? Yes, it's always running. Yes. There's all a continual refinement of both of my understanding of what reality is and how to be skillful in living life. And what I do, and my choices, my interactions, my communications, I'm always getting better. Or let's say, reality is learning to hone yeah. the instrument yes. and make it more and more perfect yes. expression. So that not only it enjoys its expression, but to communicate it so that other manifestation of itself also begin to enjoy that, ex that expression. That's why there's teaching. The teaching is simply sharing this beauty 
But it's not me sharing the beauty. It's true nature. It's not only developed my, it developed the whole school that I have developed. The people think I co-founded. I didn't co-found. I'm not as an individual capable of doing something like that. So being itself, true nature itself, this mysterious spirit developed this individual manifestation and then developed the school that we call Rodron School. Well, and it is coming through the students and the teachers of the Rodron School. One of the things that, that, that I've been kind of wrestling with over the years, wrestling is probably too strong a word, but I've been intrigued by over the years is these different people claim awakeness, self-realization, enlightenment. And it seems from listening to you that the process is never ending. So there is not a definitive state that somebody can reach as a human being on this planet in this time. That is that you mentioned the refinement that's always going on. Do, do, you, do, you ever, do you ever feel that you've met someone or you know of someone or indeed you feel in yourself the capacity to reach this, what we might call perfect balance or perfect expression of the oneness? There are many teaching who teach that you reach a certain place. Like if you're Buddhist, it's dharma, realizing the Dharmakaya. If you're Vedanta, you become the Brahman or Satchitananda. And for them, for some, they define it exactly what it is. You know, and if you're a Sufi, you become pure love, right? And if you're a Christian, you become one with Christ or one with the Father. So many teachings have an end point that is well defined, although they have different schools, slight variations. And um, I believe that myself in the teaching, this being showed me these things. I, at some point, I was a Brahman for several years. I was Dharmakaya for several years. You're talking about in this lifetime? Or in this lifetime. Okay. As part of the development yes. of this teaching. Mm. I was a Dharmakaya for non-dual awareness for several years. I was in total stillness of the Brahman for several years. All those happened. But, and I, I thought at those times, that's it. Just like what me, and especially I read the books, I study, I meet the teacher, they all say, yeah, that's it. And I will see, I believe that's it, and I'm happy, comfortable being that, and I'll teach it. And then, at some point, it changes. And of course, my mind gets into some kind of, well, what's going on? <laughs> I'm disoriented, what's going on? I thought, that's it. And then, what happens, like one time, for one, uh, one example, I was teaching a group and I was teaching them about non-conceptual pure awareness. Right? And as I was teaching, if, w the whole thing was manifesting. Non-conceptual, pure, transparent awareness is filling the whole room, being the whole room and manifesting. But as I was saying that, I felt myself receding back, going back and going deeper. My consciousness was receding back and, and I could see everybody, I could see the whole room, I see pure awareness and I realized all pure awareness and all that is happening within me. And then I realized the whole universe happening within me. Mm. And I was this, something different. I wasn't just pure, I was the source of pure awareness. Mm. This mysterious, indefinable, source of pure awareness. Like, this is just an example of how it changes. That was one of the changes, and, it's, and there's no last change. And when you said your, your, your mind had a, had, a, had a, you didn't use the word reaction, but you said your, your mind was responding somehow to it, was there any, any element of regret, or is it or is basically the, the excitement of something new, more paramount? You know, part of it was, a concern that something went wrong, that I'm not, and like uh, maybe there is some thing in me I haven't worked out, right? That I didn't understand about myself. And turned out, yes, there were, because I had 
what, what wasn't worked out was a need to be something. For instance, to be something, even, even though it's boundless and formless, pure awareness, I was still being something. You and were I, still being something. I was being something. So even though I wasn't an individual self, yes. I was still something that is real, that is still, you can touch it and feel it, and is stable. And everybody wants that stability. And I realized there was a need for stability. And then what I learned by thing changing, the stability is not it. To be stable in one place is the limitation of the freedom of true nature. But isn't it basically the mind that is wanting the stability? Yeah, the but mind. that's out the way, there's no... There's no well, well, that's it, because, you know, everybody wants stability in their life. It's because it means security, right? But the true nature itself, you see, there are people who reach a place one place and they stay, I've met people like that, like, like uh, Karmaba I mentioned. He was in this expansive, pure awareness, none all the time. I think he was like that and he might go bigger or smaller as he lives, what he does, but he was that. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I met other people who were a different thing. But in time I learned that for me, it wasn't arriving at a place, for me, it is the enlightenment in the Daimler approach, the way we learned it, is not recognizing a particular condition of reality. It is the freedom for reality to keep discovering itself without a restraint. Mm. The, what's, what's the true Enlightenment and down approach is freedom. It is freedom for being to express itself in whatever way it does at any time. And it's playing and enjoying and being creative. And, and do you find that on the human, the human side of you still has to sometimes in its own way, accept things, or is acceptance taken for granted now? Acceptance always happens in, inside you. No, sometimes, you know, like when I am in physical pain, I don't like it. Like if it's difficult. And what's difficult is, is discomfort. Although I can hold, I can accept it, and I can hold it, and I can be bigger, but it is discomfort. Yes. And sometimes it takes a while for me to let it be, right? That happens. Because I'm, as an individual, I'm still learning, mm. see? But as being, I'm free. I wrote down, it's funny, it just appeared in front of me, I wrote down one of the things you said, and it said, um, when I was researching, suffering is a heavenly message. Yeah. It's not always easy to see at the time, but... Yeah, suffering. You see, like, like in Buddhism, the, the, the whole approach is how to be free from suffering. The whole approach is uh, inherent to life that there is suffering. And uh, then the teaching is how to be free from the suffering. And the way to be free from the suffering is to be free from the self. And to just be the empty awareness or true nature. And my interest, myself, I'm not interested in being free from suffering. I am much freer from suffering. Than I, I don't have psychological suffering, let's put it that way. I can have physical suffering, but no psychological suffering. However, my interest is not freedom from suffering. That's not what I teach. What I teach is to love the truth and mm. to enjoy the discovery. Mm. To enjoy... We're not here just to be free from being here. We are here to fulfill it, mm. to be what's it for. So uh, reality didn't manifest this, all of this so that to get rid of it. It's manifested it is so that to experience things in a certain way, to, to manifest 
it's some of its potentialities that haven't been expressed yet. I'm just and thinking. it is exciting. And it's wondrous. <laughs> and that's what I want to teach people. To, I want them to catch the wonder and the delight of discovering reality. That suffering will be dealt with. We need to deal with suffering because that's part of the obstacles to the delight, part of the obstacle to the freedom. Because we're, we're hooked, we're, we're fixated, we're imprisoned by the suffering. Trying to move away from it. Yeah, it's that part way. of what we yeah. need to deal with. Yeah. And I do deal with it, and, and, and I teach my students to deal with it. We have to. But it is part of the story. The main thing for me is this luminous delight that comes through, that once, that lives, that they say even once, is, is, is a human approximation. It just does it. Mm. That's, it, is, it is the nature of what I am, of what you are, is to express itself, to manifest itself as fully as possible, and to know itself more, because it, it cannot know itself except through a con an individual consciousness like you or me. Human beings are needed by this mysterious ground express itself, to be itself, to, to talk with each other. I, I, was just, I was just thinking, we were talking at lunch earlier, that you love Sherlock Holmes. Yes. And really you use that whole world of Sherlock Holmes in this, and you're saying some of the puzzles he have to, has to solve are quite difficult puzzles, but you, the vehicle that is you, is really alive by trying to solve this constant yeah. adventure of consciousness, not necessarily trying to solve, but exploring this constant adventure of consciousness. It is an adventure of consciousness. Yeah. And that's what Aurobindo called it, adventure of consciousness. He, he, okay. he, he got that. He talked about the adventure of consciousness. And I agree with the thing about freedom from suffering, because I think there's a lot of suffering in the world. And uh, the, uh, when I see the suffering, being manifest as kindness and compassion, wanting to help, do whatever I can. But I want to help not to be free, free from, con from suffering. The help, the real help, is for them to see the delight of their being. Because their suffering cannot go away without seeing the delight of their being. Mm. You see, it's a disconnection from what we are is the main source of our psychological suffering. And that all teaching now. So we only have about two minutes left. Um, yeah. Anything you want to say in the last two minutes? Is not to assume it's difficult, not to assume it's impossible, not to assume only special people can do it, but also the other thing, not to believe it is something to arrive at, but to continue being interested in what is true, what is real, what is authentic, and let and it has no end. Like right now, for instance, people talk about non-dual awareness, being everywhere. I feel that, but at the same time, I feel I am in your heart. Mm. I am in your heart. You know why I am in your heart? Because even though I perceive that you're over there and I'm here, in my heart there isn't that. Mm. In my true heart, there's only one heart. That's so I can be inside your heart, and you're inside my heart. I could be inside the heart of anybody. In the sense, I'm feeling their heart. Mm. I am the essence of their heart. Mm. That's a different kind of realization. People talk about non-dual, boundless. This is not non-dual. It is beyond non-dual, beyond dual. And that is just an example, the other way that enlightenment realization can happen. So I'm inviting people not to box it in. Each tradition tends to box it in as one thing. And it's true, each thing is freedom and liberation. But freedom of liberation can be even further freedom, even freedom of liberation from those freedoms and liberation. So that freedom liberates itself from being anything in particular. 
Okay, that's a wonderful place to finish. I mean, thank you very much. Not being anything in particular. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> I really enjoyed our meeting. It's very I, special. I very feel so sweet and happy. <laughs> <laughs> I got to being got to express itself. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I'm just gonna just gonna show some of Hamid's yeah. book again. Is A H Almas is his pen name. So we have Essence. Diamond Heart, book five. The last of the series. That yes, one. yes. The unfolding now, realizing your true potential through the practice of presence. And the point of existence. Thanks again, Hamid. It was wonderful meeting you here. Well, that was fun too, <laughs> Ian. <laughs>